everybody. Welcome to Clay Arts Centre. You're very welcome to uh, join us here tonight. We're here with Dustin Yeager, and he is going to give his presentation, How to Write the F-Bomb on a Cup. Um, and I know a lot of people are very excited about this evening's presentation. Um, if you're new to Clay Arts Centre, uh, my name is Regina Farrell Fagan. I'm the Exhibitions Manager at Clay Arts Centre. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Dustin now in a minute. Uh, Dustin's originally from Wyoming. He's currently uh, located in Brooklyn and he has his uh, studio practice where he makes works from his ceramics and theory line. He also teaches in New York City at Greenwich House and at Park Slope in Gasworks. Um, and uh, he is an MA graduate from the School of the Art of Institute of Chicago. Uh, so we're very excited to have you here tonight, Dustin. We're looking forward to this presentation and I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Regina. Um, and thanks to the Clay Arts Center for this opportunity to come um, talk about myself. Uh, when Regina sanitized the title of this talk, it reminded me to give a content warning that there will be some adult themes and imagery happening tonight. Um, and usually it surprises myself when those pictures come up on the screen, so you've been warned. Um, let me flip over to this presentation that I have for you, and I will screen share. So that will take maybe just a minute to come up for everyone. But here we are. Like Regina said, I'm based in Brooklyn now. I spent about um, 15 years around the Midwest in Minnesota and then in Chicago for grad school and for work for a little bit and then back to Minneapolis where I worked at Northern Clay Center as I was sort of um, not realizing that I was developing this line of work that has become, um, you know, most of a full time job right now um, for when I moved back to Brooklyn five years ago when I moved to Brooklyn five years ago. Um, so I'll just jump right in. What I like about ceramics and pottery, the interesting thing to me is, is all about the sense of propriety, right? Like what you're allowed to have in your home, what you're allowed to show and to display to other people, um, and what that says about you, the image that we try to construct for ourselves to reinforce our identities and that what we want to project to other people as well um, is what's interesting to me. And here, so so I guess that's kind of the research project that I worked on in grad school, but also um, you know, kind of drives my interests in pottery and ceramics. And here's a couple examples of um, other people who come up and around that theme. And I, I guess I want to provide this as context and think about the different disciplines that all attack this this um, idea or this problem of identity. So on the on the left, we have this poster from um, a publication from 1911 by Adolf Luz, Ornament and Crime, right? Where Luz, this architect and designer and philosopher is saying that actually buildings with heavy ornamentation around the turn of the century um, actually lead to breakdowns in personalities that leads to uh, an increase in crime. And if we could only be more clean and more modern in the kind of architecture that we were endorsing, we could actually improve our society by eliminating crime. Great, solid thesis. And then we have, um, I also like this collection from about arts and crafts furniture that's called Good Citizens Furniture, where arts and crafts movement furniture from the end of the 19th century in England and America is actually being somehow tied to like nationhood and to your ability to be a good citizen just by the kinds of objects that you collect and buy and use and fill your domestic space with. So they're all assuming that the kinds of outward expressions of ornament and craft um, are a reflection of the actual internal morality of the person that's using them. And that sort of builds up to this idea in 1950 of like uh, lifestyle guides, right? And this book, The Guide to Easier Living by Mary and Russell Wright, an industrial designer and ceramic designer, um, where it actually lays out the rules for like, here's how you can live a good middle class lifestyle. And this is maybe on the early side, maybe not the first, but on the early side of books like this that I suppose grow into 
blogs and lifestyle gurus and influencers that we have now, where he's kind of taking older, old fashioned expectations of giving a dinner party or being the right kind of person in society and saying, you know what, actually now we're saying buffets are an approved style of, of entertaining, even if you're upper middle class or if you're upwardly mobile, you can still give a buffet, you can still give a barbecue, you can still um, have your place in society. And it kind of is laying out those rules to a broader middle class that maybe didn't used to have them. Um, and then it also says like, oh, you could also buy my pottery, right? You could buy your designed objects by Russell Wright and kind of purchase, buy your way into this middle-class lifestyle because the book says it's okay. Um, that builds on some older ideas about um, instructions for living. Hmm. I like rules. I like, um, I like them being spelled out. It's kind of like a, like a dictionary of how to be passive aggressive. Like here's the right way to do things. And if you don't do it by the book, you're somehow wrong. You're somehow bad. This is another example of that by Christine Fredericks, um, New Housekeeping Efficiency Studies and Home Management in 1912. You might be thinking 1912, like that's kind of about um, factories and Fordism, right? And assembly lines are being um, streamlined in a way. And Christine Frederick is part of that movement of applying Taylorism, that ability to measure and study efficiency, but applied to the domestic space, right? Applied to like a woman's sphere and the design of the home. So here she's showing um, more efficient ways that you can design a kitchen and lay it out to make it easier for the worker in that situation. Um, I made little notes here. This is kind of building on early, early, early versions of things like this. There's a, a book by Charles Eastlake from 1868, Hints on Household Taste, where Eastlake is kind of breaking down the rules and spelling out the expectations for Victorian fashions and Victorian styles um, in a very specific and limited kind of way. So it's not about your entire lifestyle, but it's about how to decorate a formal parlor in this reigning style. Um, and at about the same time, 1869, Catherine Beecher is writing The American Woman's Home. So a, a similar guide to decorating still primarily in a more American, um, slightly less maybe um, highfalutin sort of style. So lots of approaches coming into this idea of how are we talking about our identities and our expectations through the way we're decorating and arranging the spaces around us. Here's two more. Sociology, right? Pierre Bourdieu in 1960, surveying a broad swath, not a broad swath, a large number of French citizens about their expectations and their associations with different um, artistic styles and um, decorating trends so that he actually can plot them on a map between um, you know, wealth and status um, and employment and kind of map out where does this particular part of society place any particular piece of culture. And then advertising is also a really important um, discipline of people who are interested in figuring out what do people think of each other and what do people think about um, goods or items and how can we learn about the identities of our consumers and able to in order to sell to them better. So in Matalart's Advertising International in 1989, he's kind of summarizing what the advertising industry thinks about different categories of consumers. Um, and they've given them like cute names about of animals to describe the, the kinds of products that they like and maybe the advertising strategies that would be useful to reach into them. This is also a great place to say like, so far, all of the people who have been doing these studies, Borgia is a great example, have taken as their research subjects like a really specific slice of the consumer audience, right? Upper middle class people and middle class people in France selects a very elite group that's not very racially diverse. And a lot of this research that's happening in Europe, in England, in America um, is really still based on um, especially at this time, like British and Victorian taste levels and the colonialism that's imported with that. So maybe the, the 
umbrella strategies that they're finding people communicate about their identities using the objects around them apply more universally. But the particular kinds of associations that might happen with any of these pieces of culture or artworks in this graph um, are maybe more specific to the kind of culture that they're actually studying there. Okay, this sort of builds then ultimately into the 90s and 2000s, and I'm interested in the experience retail aspects of this. So on the top, you have uh, the former flagship for Ralph Lauren that's actually in a Beaux-Arts mansion. So the store purchased this a building that was built in 1893 or something, the Gertrude Rhinelander Waldo Mansion on 72nd and Madison, and actually renovated it into a full retail experience. So instead of just buying a pair of shoes or buying a pair of polos, they're actually selling you the full experience of being a turn of the century aristocrat, where you can walk into this mansion and experience the opulence that she actually designed and paid for and built in the paneling and the rugs and all of the ornamentation throughout the entire building. And then it even leaps off of the retail and the real world experience, right, into something like Martha Stewart Omnimedia, where you can um, not only buy Martha Stewart products, but you can also interact with her through the television, through her publications, through the style of photography that's saying it's not just about this set of pans, but it's about what are the countertops made of? What is she wearing? What's the view outside the window? So she's really selling you a full, a full identity that you can slip in and out of based on the kinds of things that you um, surround yourself with. When I was in grad school in 2010 and 11 and kind of doing this research, it was it was um, esoteric. It was unknown to me. I was discovering new things for myself about um, identity and about advertising strategies. Now, I think we just say, oh, it's the algorithm right now. It's it's become even more commonplace and we don't have to think about being targeted by Ralph Lauren. We just know that everything we do is tracked and all of those um, doves and foxes and those kinds of categories of buyers that advertisers want us to be are able to be broken down even more specifically into not just your demographic information, but what are what is your Google search history? What are the kinds of things that are in your various shopping carts all over the web? So that same idea of getting to know people in order to sell them things, it's all it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Terrible. Okay, but back to pottery. So as a ceramic example, then I was really interested in um, well, what can we think about people, what do we know about people, how are people using ceramics specifically to talk about their identities or to tell people different things about them. And this was the example that really stuck out in my mind. Um, Eva Zeitzel's museum coffee pot designed for the MoMA in 1950 and a mid-century um, um, standardware jug in a Tomoku glaze by Bernard Leach, who um, studied in Japan and became a master potter there, but then came back to England to set up his pottery. And it was one of the people responsible for sort of seeding and, and um, um, putting this idea of uh, Japanese craft aesthetics into the American studio pottery movements, right? So to think about what do what are our expectations, what assumptions do we make out of people who would choose to use or display either one of these items? We might imagine they have pretty different lifestyles and um, tastes. So what can we think about? What kind of person would use a basket like this? A basket I made in 2008 ish right a really um maybe a third kind of person who might not really be into either of those two pictures choosing to make some pretty bold statements about uh about their tastes and identities similarly this plate set that um is drawing on uh, a lot of traditions right that i, I took this cross hatching around the rims of these plates from uh, old English slipware from Thomas Toft and his family. Um, and I like to imagine being served, you know, brownies at a church picnic or something on this that looks very traditional, but actually has a, a hidden secret message uh, when you get down to the bottom of it. A lot of the work, okay, we're gonna talk about porcelain in a minute. 
here are some other planters from around that time where I'm starting to illustrate with um, various methods, things from the world around me, around a theme, and around some kind of expression, some kind of idea about dangers to the world. This was for a show in Montana called Dangerous Pots, and I imagined um, flower pots being thrown at people, a very uh, a clear and present danger coming from pottery, but also from global warming and from social media and from um, uh, logging trucks and from spray paint vapors, all the other kinds of things that might represent dangers. This drawing I, I really put here to come back to this idea of collaging uh, drawings later as well. So I started working with porcelain around that time because I wanted to be able to have uh, a very fine and paper-like surface that I could draw on without distorting the quality of my drawing. These are some cups I made at the very end of undergrad, cups and bowls. Um, and I think that along with the idea of drawing and putting imagery on things, I was starting to be interested in disrupting their idea of functionality, but I didn't quite have the facility with the material or the language to talk about interrupting function in some unexpected way. These are cups that I was making in 2000, um, 10, 11, 12, probably, where I was exploring different ways of putting text on work, breaking into that smooth, fine porcelain surface with all of the expectations of society and class and wealth that we, we have with porcelain. Um, thinking of ways, how can that be roughed up and ruined and destroyed while still being recognizable and sometimes functional as a vessel. Um, playing with different phrases, different words, different ways of putting text on a pot and different kinds of textures to either interrupt or reinforce those rough sorts of messages so that the style of the writing is also reflective of the text itself. Um, so these were a lot of fun to make. I was enjoying exploring different ways of putting this black texture and sometimes this reduction red on tops of things. Um, and now I look back and think, was I okay? Like, was this, hmm, I must have been, things were, things were kind of dark during this period of time. And then it kind of develops and it gets honed into a more um, specific kind of product line. And this happened in conjunction with friends who were opening stores and wanting to order some of these and telling me like, I can't sell unpredictable pots and all of these different kinds of styles. She said, give me a fuck this and give me a fuck that and I'm gonna need a dozen of each, right? So it kind of helped me click in my brain into like, oh, right, to make this a career, to make something that can be reproducible, I kind of have to hone in and refine what that product line can ultimately look like and what the phrases that I can use are. So it developed into this style of the black and white and sometimes colorful with script text. Some styles look better with just a smooth, cleanly thrown porcelain vessel and a pencil line on them. The sipper is fine for a small vase or for like a, a wine or alcoholic beverage. This is the long fuck cup. Um, I've always liked things that have variation in a series. I don't really, I, I could somehow slip casting these or making them identical kind of kills the product for me. It kills the artwork, but it also is no fun. So I throw all of these individually and do all of the writing on them myself. I also got interested in, in goblets. I like jokes, turns out. I like uh, ceramic jokes, like goblets made out of porcelain are a terrible idea. Um, they're really hard to make, <laughs> they're really fragile. And when I set about starting to make uh, this set of goblets, you know, I would hold a vessel um, six or eight inches above the table and then just kind of jam things underneath it until it found a way to equilibrium and standing up and still sort of drawing on uh, I, I think about this as a really traditional way of making pottery, right? I'm drawing on the influences and the things that are surrounding me in my culture. It just turns out that they're not like 
leaves and fish and the beauty of nature and other maybe more traditional um, um, ideas of what might be decorating on pottery. So it's things from gay culture and from hookup culture and from digital culture that are translated and put onto this object. I like the idea of a goblet being, it's, it's a performative piece. There's something about um, you hold it and you walk around with it in a certain um, way that's associated with celebration or with some kind of high class thing. So I think that juxtaposition of a rough destroyed object with an aggressive message combined with that form it's enjoyable to me. Um, I also made these plates in the similar style of drawing from hookup culture and from gay dating apps that are uh, intimate images exchanged by, by text. Um, and I like this piece because it, 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 it associates with commemorative plates. It associates with China cabinets and ideas of display while also you know, invoking ideas of privacy. Were these messages exchanged in confidence? Can they ever be identifiable except by the person who took the image, right? So there's an idea of outing oneself, of recognizing oneself, um, as well as being a voyeur into this um, exchange of images. And these are each maybe 12, 10, 11, 12, 13 inch. Um, thrown porcelain plates with an inlaid drawing and then some gold luster uh, embellishment on each piece too. I call this piece trash can and it's a it's a trash can from an exhibition. It's a porcelain trash can I made for an exhibition in 2013 that was about gender and sexuality in contemporary ceramics. So this was a piece that you know, some of the dick plates were displayed there too, and the next piece was on view in the same gallery. This was a piece where people could further be implicated. So I liked using um, mirrors to draw people into the work and say like, you're part of this ongoing dialogue about sexuality and romance um, as well, right? It's not just a piece that's kind of over and done and settled. So people could come and write in um, a love letter or a hate letter or a letter to a former, current or future lover. And then it would be displayed on this wall. And then the next person would come in and tear that off and throw it away and write their own piece. So there was this kind of interactive narrative um, part of this story happening as well. And I made this set of garden stools for that exhibition that are covered in all of these decal images. I started the stools without exactly knowing how I wanted to decorate or finish them, or maybe even totally what the theme would be for these pieces. Um, and ended up ordering a lot of these custom full color ceramic decals. This was a time in, especially in Minneapolis, when there was a big fight for um, gay marriage on the state level and on the national level. And um, I just love the idea of Reagan juxtaposed with this symbol for AIDS and HIV, and there was rainbow flags everywhere, and it's just very controversial. Uh, but at the same time as the world was celebrating and thinking about all of these really positive things that were happening. We were also aware, especially in Minneapolis, of a trans woman, C.C. McDonald, who had been attacked and then was in prison for, um, for self-defense, for, for killing her attacker. So all the while that we're kind of celebrating gay marriage, which is traditionally or majorly fought for by um, you know, upper class, predominantly white homosexuals, men, um, you know, we're still fighting a global AIDS epidemic and we're fighting in a world where HIV positive rates, especially among Black women, were growing significantly, where trans rights were being really left out of that discussion entirely. So I wanted to kind of blend all of these things and together and maybe problematize this idea of, um, of how far we have come just because we've achieved some kind of gay marriage milestone. Then um, and this and this kind of style of work of of collaged decal images relates back to the planters where um, I realized I was trying to overlap 
drawings from different sources and cutting them out and pasting them together, but I just didn't quite have the technology or the understanding of this clay material at the time. So that comes through, um, you know, full strength here, I think, where uh, I can take images from the internet and resize them and cut them out and improvise as I apply them to a three dimensional form. This is also making jokes about some like, mid century abstract expressionist um, ceramic objects where the clay is kind of piled and left to be sort of rough, but here ultimately queered, right? Not just with um, sexual organs, but with this tassel drapery um, being very effete and draped around it and providing another kind of movement, right? It's not just the ephemerality of the clay object, but of this fabric object that's been dipped and frozen in time and then fired into porcelain. Here's a little bit more of that work. I like how these objects are um, imbued with pop culture images with celebrities who are well known at the time or trending at the time, but that might be forgotten <laughs> very quickly thereafter, either um, for good or for bad reasons. Um, and even with some of the text based work, I like that these uh, images and phrases are meant to be ephemeral, right? It's an emoji that goes out quickly and scrolls by before um, before anyone thinks too much about it. It says an emotion in the moment and then it's gone. The same with um, uh, uh, expletives or curse words, right? That are meant to be very hot for a very short amount of time, uh, as well as like celebrities and other um, and other pop culture phenomena that come and go memes kind of earlier than that. These are, um, uh, I've made these smaller cup based uh, decal collages as like a souvenir from a show. So you could maybe not have the big object, but could kind of take some of that with a smaller piece. This painting on the left is a, a painting from the 70s by Sylvia Slay, where she is objectifying men's bodies in the way that artists have always kind of objectified and used women's bodies. So there's art history jokes in here and there's ceramic jokes in here and pop culture jokes kind of spread throughout. And then the latest piece in that series I've made was this. Um, and I've been really interested in not making maybe the entire collage or the entire surface just out of decal images, but how I can combine more of the form and um, some color field painting work and then images still going on top of that. So I'm thinking about those layers of things all coming together a little bit more now. A word on words. Uh, I wanted to call this talk How to Write Fuck on a Cup, uh, mostly because I think it's a funny title, but it's also like a how and why to write fuck on a cup. And I think that bit about expletives being quick phrases is one way of how I think about the kinds of words that I like to write on cups. But I think having made this body of work for 10-ish years, what is funny to me about it is how it works with the expectations of the entire piece. So it kind of creates this like narrative arc based on the, the style of the piece, the porcelain background of the piece sets one kind of cool, modern, clean expectation. The cursive further, I think, helps people to think this is going to be um, a calming experience to read. And then when you read it, it's kind of like the punchline of the joke, right? That this actually isn't, um, isn't a calming <laughs> thing that I can, that my mother appreciates so much after all. Um, this is more fully that collection. I worked with a photographer a couple of years ago to kind of put everything together into, into a little bit of a scene. So the black and white pieces and the white and pencil pieces sort of all crowded together into this family portrait. I worked for a long time to try to think of something positive to say on this work. I've started feeling very self-conscious about these negative messages all the time. And this is how far I got, I got to dope. And I would try sometimes to write um, other messages in that black and white cursive style, but it just never, it never worked. It wasn't satisfying to me. I don't think it looked good. It didn't read right. It didn't connect with an audience. It wasn't the right 
thing until I started experience it, ex experimenting with this body of work and realized like, oh, right, this is kind of design and especially like graphic design or text design 101. If you have a different message, you need a different style to go with it. So positive messages don't work with that really active graphic black and white style something like bubble letters and a more richly layered background of this custom blended speckled porcelain um, in a little bit more comfortable form a little bit more celebratory kind of piece works better for this other line of work that was dope and resilient and successful and i'd write intense and i like some of those because they're like backhanded like oh you can be intense but like intense is also a really good thing um, I just took this extra vase out of the kiln today. It looks great. Extra is a good word. I, a, um, a woman who owns a store asked for extra. I thought, oh, why didn't I think of that? So we uh, put these all together in this kind of like after a track meet, uh, triumphant sort of experience with ribbons and, and grass. And then the last year or so I've been excited about this, really two years, uh, more colorful style. And I think what this has let me get into is having some longer phrases, right? It's a voice, it's a style that lets me have a few more words. It can be a little bit more expressive in the style of the letters that I'm using. And I've always, I like color a lot in the rest of my life. So it's a great way to incorporate um colors and contrasts i really love color field painting and the emotions that can come with that as well as uh, a place that i can use a black letter so a darker kind of text um, and this was really hard to narrow down to about 10 phrases that i write a lot but it also gives me a lot of room to maneuver and play with new sorts of phrases or requests on it as well Here's just, these came out last winter. Okay, and I guess that's it. And here, so this was when I was taking pictures last month, I had several of these pieces around. I think they also play really nicely together. So all of those styles of the active movement brush strokes and the more um, restful, cleaner pieces with just the movement of this ocean waves of the U going across. Uh, fit really well. And I'm playing with a style that doesn't actually have text at all. It's kind of a black background with color spots around it that has been really fulfilling to see. I have some more pieces here on my table that just came out of the kiln today in that style. Okay, that's all. Oh, look, there's one more. Okay, so this is, uh, I unloaded a kiln today for of work that's coming up for a sale I'm doing with the Crisscross Ceramic Collective that opens on Saturday. So there's 10 artists in the sale and collection, um, and we're each hosting online sales for the next week. Uh, other things that I took out of the kiln today that I'm really excited about are small collaborations and things that I've discussed pairing pieces and partnering with other artists. So I made some small saucers and catch-all trays that were a great place to just experiment with color and borrow some phrases from other people. Um, and they are so cute. I can't wait to photograph them. Okay, uh, I think Regina is going to take us back to like some question and answer time now. Yes, I am. Thank you, Justin. Um, thank you for uh, ending the screen there. Um, so I'm going to take some questions. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the chat menu, or you can use the raise hand feature. Uh, just reading here on the side. Just. So Dustin, I'm going to start you off because I know that um, yeah, from experience, you know, some of the things that people are interested in. Um, could you talk about uh, the clay body you use, what temperature you fire to, uh, some of your process from that end of things? Sure. Um, like I said, I got into porcelain when I was wor working and teaching in Chicago because I wanted a fine, smooth body that I could draw on with that pencil and that I could carve into without a lot of craggy things happening. So I worked with that porcelain around from continental clay in the Midwest. And now I order a clay body from um, high water clay. I get it from Baltimore. And I still fired a comb tin. I fired an electric kiln now, mostly because I was scared of 
testing a new glaze <laughs> when I moved to Brooklyn. So it's still in the back of my mind. Someday I need to do the research and move to a cone six process, but I'm cone 10 and oxidation, which also helps me get all those bright colors from the underglaze. Well, thank you so much. Um, I have a question here from Matt. He said, what do you imagine people drink from these? I'm not sure exactly which uh, vessel he's talking about, but I guess it's a general question. Sure. I always made the tall tumbler form as a cup, but I know a lot of people like that form as a small vase as well. Um, so I think iced coffee is great. Your summertime lemonade, fluids, coffee and tea and everything else from the mugs as well as, um, you know, if you drink alcohol, that also holds alcohol really well. And I thought I had another answer, lost it. Oh, okay. Um, somebody was asking about uh, when you do the writing on the cup, are you using an underglaze pencil and uh, what kind of pencil are you using? Yeah, the the white cups with the pencil script is just an Amico, Amico black underglaze pencil. Um, do you freehand the written words? And uh, the comment is that uh, Wendy, she said she loves the juxtaposition of the delicate work and the rough wording. Oh, thanks. Hi, Wendy. Uh, yeah, that's it's all written one at a time every time. Oh, that's actually amazing. <laughs> it, <you> never, <laughs> it's very <laughs> it's time it's to do. <laughs> <laughs> Some days when I'd have to write 20 or 30 of them before yeah. breakfast, it's like a it's a great um, tension releasing way to start your morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually gave one of your uh, uh, cups to my friend for her 50th and she said it was the most appropriate um, present she'd ever received. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, and kind of like Matt's question about what do people drink too, I also think I see a lot of people displaying them, right? You can display it empty. So coming back to that idea about identity and what do we say, how do we communicate our values to people? I think that there is now a market for people who want to express their frustration in this, um, frustration or um open-mindedness i mean call it what you their their inner rage even where people want to have this on a shelf in their bathroom maybe not doing anything but um being a place for them to tell you something about themselves do you mind if people use the pieces for something completely not what you maybe intended for it for oh i don't get to mind i mean once it's made and it's out there, in, in college, I was like, I swear to God, if someone puts a pencil in my cup, I'll never make another one in my entire life. But no, now I see pictures from people who have them with colored pencils and a friend has it as a pen holder, right? It's great. You can use it for whatever you want. Uh, could you take us through your, um, your, your design process, you know, when you're planning to make your work? Uh, what's your typical day like? Hmm. My sketchbook primarily is lists, it's lists of potential phrases that I might come back to and use again. I still get bored writing the same thing over and over and over. So that new line of colorful work that I call pep talk is a good place to allow myself to, to make a couple weird things every now and then. But it's lists of orders that I need to make for stores and for galleries. Um, and then like a timeline of how those things need to come out. So a lot of days are just like, today I need to throw as many things as I can towards um, the next kiln load full of work. Um, we just did, the, the Criss Cross group just did a series of live talks last week, um, or I was talking to another artist, Liana Agnew, and we were talking about, right, how do you approach developing a new form or something new? Um, I think both of us answered, I haven't made a new thing for seven years, but I think that I'm really wheel based. So I know that if I'm approaching a new form, it's probably going to be round, probably. Um, and I have some language about that 
like a thin lip on a drinking vessel. My favorite cups growing up were the glasses at my grandma's house instead of the like thick glasses in our farmhouse that you like let children use. Um, so I like that, the feeling of a thinner rim on my lip when I'm drinking from it. Um, other styles of work have a little bit thicker rim. So there's a kind of visual element that can go through things. Mm. The sculptural work is a lot of fun. And when I teach hand building students, I say, you know, like in wheel, there's a lot of rules you have to follow. You do things right every step of the way and you end with a successful thing. But hand building, there's no rules. Like as long as it sticks together at the end of day, you did it right. So the hand built sculptural pieces, I kind of think of an, a form that I want to work towards. I'm working for a couple pieces in a show this fall that I've started sketching up in my mind um, and have kind of a general outline of the profile. And then I think about parts that will be pinchy hand built and parts that might be thrown slabs that are taken off the wheel and cut apart and assembled and other little bits that are glommed onto them. Um, I hope that answers the question. Ask more, ask more details. I'll talk more. Um, I just had a question here about uh, ceramics and theory uh, as your brand name. Where did that come about and uh, how come you don't use it as your artistic name? Oh, gosh. Well, ceramics and theory came about when I finished grad school in 2011, and I thought I might um, have a website where I would have essays and writing pieces as well as my ceramic work. So I bought this domain, Ceramics and Theory, because my, you know, the fields that I was working in in my research are like material culture studies and cultural theory, and it's kind of art history and anthropology. But um, that theory side sort of dropped by the wayside as the ceramics side grew up. So they're related and they're interesting together in my mind. Um, but then they stopped. I also learned about there's trends and how things get named. So right now we're in a trend where like brands are friendly and have human names like Casper and Quip and other brands that like say hello to you and want to be your friend. In 2010, we were in a, in a trend of and <laughs> lots of stores and brands and restaurants from the time were this and that. Um, so ceramics and theory was also me giving in to that, to the naming trend that was happening at the time. Um, and so I'm really, I'm, I'm always conflicted about it. And maybe I'm not supposed to be about, should I have just used, and used my name at the time or should I have put it underneath this brand? The brand is kind of this functional line or, yeah, I guess it's a functional line or a functional project that has these different collections underneath it, right? The fuck cups line and the pep talk line and the other things that come up. Um, but I think of the sculptural work as more, you know, it's one-off artistic work that I that, that I don't put ceramics and theory on. I think that that explains it pretty well. Um, you have a, a, a nice uh, thing going on where you still uh, enter exhibitions and you still make functional work. Um, how how long do you stay with an idea, um, especially when you're making your functional work? I I just I mean it's been eight years. I've thought everyone who wants a fuck cup is going to have one, and I'm going to have to start something else. But still, people keep coming out of the woodwork to buy them, so I'll make them. <laughs> uh, I think that I like that that line has continued so long. It's really great, um, and I think that's why other artists and you know in fashion and other kinds of things work on different collections, so I can have something new come up alongside it and it doesn't diminish the original the original that fuck this and fuck that line too um sculptural work i really just make when i have an exhibition to get to or maybe if i'm really driven to to get something out so those ideas are a little bit more ephemeral and as culture changes and like the speed of memes and the speed of of images has changed so much since that exhibition where I started it in 2013. Um, the, the the most recent piece I made that was about Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford was on that was like, <laughs> I have to Google 
wh wh when was that? Who was that? What are these names? Four months later, is forgotten. Um, you and I had an a interesting conversation the other day about you know growth and expansion during the time of uh, COVID, which obviously we're still in. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the impact on you as a, a, a potter and on your work and what you've learned from this past few months? Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate it. It's, it's pushed me in a lot of great ways. And I've thought of a lot of silver linings throughout the last year to this. It's helped me to see, you know, classes, of course, all dried up last spring and summer. Um, and the studios that chose to still offer classes online did that and I felt really lucky to be able to have my messy studio space where I could just set up and teach for an evening or an afternoon instead of working on my kitchen table and to think through that process for what it must be like for my students to need to work on their coffee tables and on their desks and how do they store work in their small New York apartments as well. Um, it was really great for me to have some hand-built projects going in my studio because usually it's so many circles and everything is thrown so it was great for me to have some larger um hand-built things in my visual environment while i was working on that other work that was really nice and um helped to show that maybe i don't need to teach quite as many classes as i was that i can still have a practice without teaching i was teaching four classes at the beginning and i'm teaching fewer now um and i'm yeah I, and may, not totally related to the pandemic but um it, re it really is inspiring to work with students as well and on zoom and in person to see people's fresh approach to the material to see the kinds of things that they're struggling with to think about how to explain different processes really deepens how I think about them too. Thank you, Dustin. Um, what would you say is your biggest challenge uh, as a maker? Mm. I think I would say it's making time to try new things. I think that the practice I have as a production potter, right, that any production potter faces is the repetition, is a certain kind of headspace, but creating time in the week to experiment on something new um, is a challenge for me. Okay, I think that I think that's all the questions we have for you tonight. Thank you so much for your time. That was really wonderful. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, really appreciate you all being here. And uh, we'll see you back here again soon at Clay Arts Center. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Regina.